heard this story on the one translation or another so many times, we probably could carry it back in one form or another quite easily. And it becomes just words. And while it is a story told with words, it is a reality that goes way beyond them. And that's the difficulty of even trying to preach beyond a brief reflection. Words become the answer. What we witness today, what we begin this morning, as we begin Holy Week, is almost this, call it schizophrenic, if you will, a very strange week of, of prayer and liturgy that starts out with triumph and ends in brutality. And you know all the characters. I dare to say many of you now have the face of Peter, the face, the face of all the others, firmly in, 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 lost in your memories. Um, sorry, Jules, you're forever going to be a, a weenie. <laughs> the good friend. <clears throat> and Jim is a good thief. There's something about a former warden being a good thief, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with <laughs> But you know the characters, you know the drama. Focus on one name, and that is the name of Jesus. We in the 21st century, we are now the children of, of a culture that makes us very comfortable with celebrities who are known by their one name. And for those of you who are old enough, you might remember an Elvis or a Cher, Madonna. Or if you play sports, you know Michael or Kobe or Shaq or Brianna. But focus on this name. Focus on the name of the person who gives his life for us. Who is known as God saves. Or in Hebrew, Joshua. Or in English, Jesus. This person enters Jerusalem, probably a much warmer day than we entered this church. Triumph and celebration, and within five days he is given up to death. Not only death, state sponsored terrorism. It's brutality, it's death on a cross. Death on a cross is the worst possible way to die. It's reserved for slaves and criminals and aliens, for people who have no rights no hope. Within five days of being received with all of the military honors of a conquering general, he is going to endure physical torture, social rejection, and the utter spiritual abandonment. And if the words of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If those words mean nothing to you, you have not experienced yet pain in your life. And if you have, you know what those words mean, and you can understand why someone would cry them out in the moments of dying. When Paul tries to tell the story to these Christians in Philippi, the reading that we're on there, the second reading, he asks in the context of a question, would someone love you that much? Would someone care about you that much? Would someone offer himself for you that much? And the answer to that question is one word. It is Jesus. It is the answer that God gave. It is the answer that Paul gives. Paul tells those people and what he probably did is he took a song that Christians used to sing. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11 probably was a hymn that they sang. Because it's very poetical. And it says that this, Jesus in his very being participated in the very nature of God. He was essentially, unalterably God. Whatever that means, I try to wrap my mind about it, as limited as my mind is. And he emptied himself of that. As empty as this glass is, as empty and barren and and as if I had this full of water, I poured it on the ground here. Whatever he was as God, he empties himself of that, literally makes himself of no reputation. Those are the words mean quite literally, if you translate them word for word. He came among us, he lived among us, he took upon himself the stuff of being human. <coughs> being human at times means to be servant, to be humble, to be disappointed, to be hurt, to be misunderstood, and ultimately, God. His entire life was a pouring out of love, and his death is a pouring out of love. It is unselfish, it is obedient, it is total love for God and for all of God's creatures. But Paul equates that with being a slave. Because a slave is a person who has no rights, no freedom, no choice, no life, and no hope. And that is what he does for us. He takes the form of a slave becomes human like us, obedient to the point of accepting even death on the cross. And the lesson is this, and the reflection is this, and you don't need to hear anything other than this. For humankind to be redeemed, for humanity, as simple and low as it can sometimes sink, to be 
brought back to a God that he so, so often rejects. For sin and death itself to finally die, for us to be restored as the image of God, he had to do this, accepting death, even death on a cross. So as we begin this week, a week with incredibly long and powerful readings, a week that takes us to a high and a low and a high again, a week that focuses on the themes of servanthood and love and commitment and friendship and betrayal and death. It takes us to the glory of Good Friday and to the power and majesty of Easter Sunday morning, one week from now. Jesus experiences his calling and his destiny for us. Because God loved us that much that God would empty himself so let this week we give you hope. Enjoy the time. Take the time. And realize what was done for you. For love. Because that is what God is about. For you. For love. That every knee should bend in heaven on earth. And every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father.